Today we are going to see a big topic that is ovarian neoplasms. We all know that ovary has many layers and many types of tumors as well. First let's see what are the functional cysts of ovaries. They are just the retention cyst and the most common cysts are follicular cyst, follicular hematomas, lutein cyst of the ovary that is corpus luteum or granulosa lutein cyst, theca lutein cyst and whenever there are multiple cysts present in ovary the conditions are like OHSs or PCOD. Now you all know that ovulation is taking place from ovaries every cycle, every month. So whenever there is retention of this, either the follicle which is developing in size, if it doesn't rupture, there is retention, then there can be formation of follicular cyst. Or if there is hematoma and collection of blood, it becomes follicular hematoma. Then the corpus luteum or the theca lutein cyst which are seen along with vesicular mole, these are the cysts which are there but they are not any type of tumors. Multiple functional cysts like in OHSs. When you see that patient is treated for infertility, there is ovulation induction being done. There are multiple follicle formation and that causes ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. PCOD in which there is an ovulation. So the graphene follicle which is growing in size gradually just get accumulated at the periphery of the ovary and that gives appearance of pearl string on ultrasound and this multicystic ovary is typical that bulky ovary with a lot of cortex uh, the medulla thick medulla is typical of PCOD. Now how to manage this functional cyst? They are not troublesome as such but if they are bigger in size, that is around 5 cm and more or some books say 7 cm and more, they are likely to undergo torsion, especially the simple cysts uh, which are just fluid containing. They are freely mobile in the cavity. So how do we manage them? We all know because ovary is having ovulation and there is retention, that is why they are causing this collection of fluid and the cyst. So let's give rest to the ovary and this fluid will get absorbed. So how to give rest to the ovary? By giving ossicles over a period of three cycles, there will not be ovulation and gradually this cyst will get absorbed. But I was talking about the size. Suppose this cyst is less than 5 cm, then we can give rest and see to it that the cyst decreases in size and gradually vanishes. But if the size is more, then we always fear of torsion. Because this is a simple cyst, mobile, having a pedicle, so they are likely to undergo torsion. So we should tell the patient that if she has acute abdomen, she is supposed to come back to us immediately. And in case of torsion, we need to do operative procedure. That's why to avoid this complication, we can treat the cyst by different methods if they are growing in size or become 5 to 7 cm and more. If there is a simple cyst, which is fluid containing cyst, we can either go for ultrasound guided aspiration of the fluid, but then in that case, there is chance of recurrence that again the cyst may get filled. Or we can go for laparoscopic cystectomy, or we can go for open cystectomy. So these are certain simple treatments which are done for the simple retention type of cyst. Theca lutein cysts which are present in vesicular mole, they are because of that excessive HCG secretion. There is because excessive LH action and thus there is formation of big theca lutein cysts, mostly bilateral. So these cysts, as there would be uh, evacuation of the vesicular mole, the HCG content would go down and naturally the cyst will disappear. OHSS is a condition when it is treated conservatively, those cysts will also vanish. In PCOD, as anovulation is the cause of this cyst which are arranged in periphery, we usually give the patient treatment in the form of we ask her to do exercises, weight reduction, change in lifestyle and if she is interested in conceiving, then we go for ovulation induction in such patients. So this is what were the functional cyst of the ovary. Now we will see what do we mean by ovarian tumors. Now of all the gynecological cancers, ovarian malignancies represent the greatest clinical challenge. 
Why? Because these ovaries are inside the abdominal cavity and usually till later stage they don't give rise to any kind of symptoms. In CA cervix, the cervix is exposed outside, there would be symptoms like white discharge, irregular bleeding or there would be foul smelling discharge. So some clue we get or patient comes to a doctor with some kind of symptoms even in early stages. Or rather, even though the patient doesn't have symptoms, it is easy to screen for CA cervix in the form of pap smear because that is a place where we can just put a speculum and look at the cervix. But that's not the case in case of ovaries. So that is why most of the times the tumor gets undetected for a longer time. And whenever we detect the tumor, most of the times it's too late. So it's, it has highest fatality to case ratio of all the gynecological malignancies. Eventually, 80 to 85 percent of women with ovarian cancer, they die. And they are seen in all age groups. In all age groups, ovarian tumor can be there because of the variety of cells and the variety of types they have. Almost 80 percent, that is most ovarian cancers are epithelial in origin and the incidence increases with age. Now, what is the etiology? Whenever ovary is under stress, there is stress on the ovary because you know every time, every month from puberty till menopause, ovary is undergoing trauma, ovulation, healing, ovulation, healing, ovulation, healing. So that leads to the, the trigger for formation of malignancy. So if there is history of infertility and ovulation induction or maximum time there is ovulation induction, those are the factors which lead to ovarian cancer. Risk factors, age, they are seen in all age groups. But average, the epithelial, which is the commonest, they are seen in menopausal, perimenopausal. So average age is 60 years. In cases where early menarche and late menopause is there, means again maximum ovulation, that will lead to CA ovary. ovary. Family history, we are going to see this point in detail. Ovulation induction in the form of clomiphene citrate or gonadotrophins that will lead to ovarian cancer. Personal or family history of breast cancer, they go hand in hand, ovarian, ovarian cancer and breast cancer. So if there is personal and family history, personal or family history of this, then we should be very cautious that if there is breast cancer in the patient, we should keep looking for ovarian cancer. She has great chances. Even in her family, if she has history of breast cancer in some of the relatives, maybe first degree, then she has greatest risk of having CA ovary. Tal can use of asbestos. Low parity. Again, low parity means low period of amenorrhea or anovulation. Uh, lactation would be less. A period of amenorrhea will not be there. Again, maximum ovulation that will lead to as a risk factor to CA ovary. Hereditary is very important. First or second degree relative with history of ovarian tumor, if in case of any patient is there, then we should keep a watch on that lady because she has very high risk of developing CA ovary. There is association of mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. BRCA gene is present on chromosome 17 and BRCA2 gene is present on chromosome 13. These are tumor suppressor genes. If they are present, they decrease the risk. But if there is any kind of mutation in these genes is found, then naturally the patient has highest risk of having cancers like CA ovary, CA breast. Pattern of inheritance is autosomal dominant. Again, there is this syndrome called as Lynch syndrome where multiple adenocarcinoma, kind of familial colon cancer that is Lynch 1, ovarian, endometrial, CA breast and hereditary non polyposis coli is seen. So this is Lynch 1. So again, if there is history of these cancers, we should either, there are two or three options available for such patients because they are constantly under fear of having CA ovary. One thing suggested that once she completes her family, we can go for prophylactic oophorectomy, bilateral, and then patient can be on HRT. But there are many views. By doing bilateral uh, oophorectomy, prophylactic oophorectomy reduces the risk by 90%. But again, 
tube should also be removed because tubal carcinoma can be there. Risk of hereditary non-polyposis coli remains still, so it doesn't give 100% protection. Other thing is, we can uh, start her on occipils. Or third thing, we can keep screening this patient with the help of clinical examination, clinical pelvic examination, ultrasound, especially TVS where ovarian size has been monitored, along with CA125, the marker for epithelial ovarian tumors. So with the help of these three things, we can keep monitoring the patient every six monthly or one yearly if she has these genes positive. This BRCA1, BRCA2 is again very important from exam point of view. Lynch 1, Lynch 2 syndrome and the prophylactic management. There are certain protective factors as well for CA ovary. Again, these factors, if you think, they are the ones who will suppress or avoid ovulation. If ovulation is less in number, the chances of having CA ovary is less in that particular woman. So what are those factors? Breastfeeding. If she is breastfeeding for longer time, she has decreased risk, multiparity, pregnancy, anovulation, use of occipils or DMPA, Mirena. Because of these, if there is no ovulation or progesterone supplementation, that will lead to that act as protective factors for CA ovary. Now we just, just have a look at the histology of the ovary before going for the types of tumors which we see in the ovary. Ovary has surface epithelium, then below which there is subepithelial connective tissue, then there is parenchyma that is cortex which has sex cells and then there is medulla where the main vascularity is there. It has primordial follicles which contain granulosa cells and thick acids. So ovary has a capacity to form tumors of all these cells which are present there. Epithelium is quite similar to the mesoepithelium of the peritoneum. So as we see the types, you will see that all these type of epithelium can be there or the tumors can be seen as C ovary. The common classification is the most common tumor is common epithelial tumors in which you will see all the genital tract epithelium is forming tumor like serous tumor, mucinous, endometroid, clear cell that is mesonephroid, Brenner's tumor, mixed epithelial tumor, undifferentiated and unclassified. In common epithelial tumors, the, the tumors to be remembered are serous, mucinous, endometroid and Brenner is very common or very important tumor in epithelial variety. Then coming to the sex cord, there is granulosa stromal cell tumor and theca cell tumor. And from the Sertoli or Lelic cell, as you know that when the embryology of ovary tells us that it has capacity to develop into Sertoli Lelic cell as well. So once the tumor starts forming, there can be even Sertoli and Lelic cell tumor that is called as androblastoma or gynandroblastoma. Lipid cell tumor, germ cells, they form dysgerminoma, again a very important tumor, endodermal sinus tumor, embryonal carcinoma, polyembryoma, choriocarcinoma and again a most important tumor of ovary that is teratoma, a most important germ cell tumor. I am telling you few because this is a big classification, it is not possible for you to remember all the types but at least concentrate on two or three tumors of each variety where maximum questions are being asked. Gonadoblastoma, pure and mixed and then the rest of the tumors like soft tissue, unclassified, secondary which are metastatic tumors from other organs. Now let's see the important ones. Epithelial carcinomas are very important. 85 to 90 percent of the ovarian tumors are epithelial innovation. What's the age group to be seen? Peri and postmenopausal, 45 years and plus. So suppose in MCQ, uh, the age of the patient has been given that around 45 years lady, lady comes with a tumor. The first thing come, should come to your mind is epithelial carcinomas. They are most common, that is first thing. Second thing, the age group 
what is given to the patient is around that where epithelial cell carcinoma is very common peri and post menopausal 45 years and plus sex cord stromal cell tumors they are seen 5 to 7 percent and they are seen in reproductive age group that is 20 to 40 years and germ cell tumors the frequency is 6 to 7 percent they are seen in pre-pubertal and pubertal phase so if a young girl comes with mass in abdomen ovarian mass think of germ cell if a middle aged lady or 20 to 40 years reproductive age group think of sex cord cell and if the lady is old then think of epithelial carcinomas now we'll see epithelial ovarian cancer in detail they arise from surface epithelium of the ovary and account from almost 80 to 90 percent of all ovarian tumors and from malignant ovarian tumor epithelial forms almost 90 percent so see how important they are they are divided into three types that is benign borderline and malignant the malignant the invasive cancer occur most often in women between 50 to 70 years of age they are of these varieties the important ones serous mucinous clear cell endometroid and unspecified now over here as I told you in last slide that they can be benign and they can be malignant. So serous cystadenoma is a benign variety and serous cystadenocarcinoma is a malignant variety. Mucinous cystadenoma is benign, mucinous cystadenocarcinoma is malignant. So this is how they are of benign type where there can be even malignant change. And what is borderline variety? Borderline ovarian tumor is grade 0, that is the grade of histology. They account almost for 15% of the epithelial ovarian cancer. They have very low malignant potential. They affect young women and may present during pregnancy. Microscopically, they show malignant features, but there is no stromal invasion. Again, this is an important thing from MCQ point of view, that they have features of malignancy like those nuclei or even mitotic figures seen but they never have stromal invasion. They have very good prognosis. The five-year survival rate is almost 90% and they remain confined to a ovary for a long period of time. So borderline ovarian tumor, the prognosis is good. They are the tumors with low malignant potential. Now epithelial cancer, they as we said that almost somewhere 60 to 80 percent these and malignant tumor almost 90 percent they're usually bilateral serous is most common so see now how the question is changing from ovarian tumor epithelial are the common from malignant ovarian tumor again epithelial common 90 percent now in epithelial whatever types we have seen in that serous variety is most common almost 40 to 50 percent and mucinous is 10 percent Large in size, mucinous tumor, they have mucin-like substance in them. They form big tumors, maybe sometimes loculated, having septations, and if they rupture, that give rise to pseudomyxoma peritoni. Means the mucinous substance gets lodged into the abdominal cavity, sagolite gel, and they form settlings all over the peritoneum, and this is called as pseudomyxoma peritoni. This condition, myxoma peritoma, can also be seen when mucosal of appendix ruptures and the mucus lands up in the peritoneal cavity. In the treatment of ovarian carcinomas, surgery and chemotherapy are the basis of treatment. And chemotherapy has different drugs. Especially for epithelial tumors, the drugs are carboplatin and paclitaxel, so you have to remember these two drugs for the treatment of epithelial cancers from point of view of your exams. There is fifth variety of epithelial cancer is Brenner's tumor. This is a transitional cell tumor. Benign, solid, it resembles fibroma. It is commonest in postmenopausal group, usually unilateral. Till now, for serous, mucinous, clear and endometroid variety of epithelial cells, I told you, yes, they are seen in later age group, but they are usually bilateral. They are cystic, either having serous fluid or having mucinous fluid. Here, this is a tumor which again is found in postmenopausal group, 
but unilateral, benign, solid, resembling fibroma. And it on cut surface, it gives greedy feeling. Every word about Brenner's tumor is important. Every word. It gives rise to pseudomix syndrome. Now, what is mixed syndrome? Mixed syndrome is seen in fibroma where there is formation of, means there is presence of fibroma that is ovarian tumor and there is presence of ascitic, ascitic fluid and hydrothorax, maybe unilateral or bilateral. The ascitis is because of the fluid release or uh, because of the fluid getting leaked out from the fibroma associated with peritoneal irritation and through the lymphatic channels this fluid goes into the pleural cavity giving rise to either unilateral or bilateral hydrothorax most commonly seen on right side this is mix syndrome pseudomix is associated with in pseudomix the same picture ascites plus hydrothorax is there but the tumor is not fibroma it is either Brenner's or granulosa cell tumor or Thicoma. Cut surface, I, I told, you, told you that Brenner's tumor. Walthard cell nests are seen, that is the transitional epithelium. And the cells in Brenner's tumors are puffed wheat. They look like the wheat which is puffed up. So they are having a central ridge kind of thing. Every word and everything is important from MCQ point of view. Please remember pseudomix whenever we talk about Brenner's tumor. Coming to the sex cord stromal tumor, they are composed of granulosa, theca and sertoli cells which is the sex cord stroma from where the ovarian stroma forms. As we all know, granulosa cell is a source of estrogen. So if we have a tumor of granulosa cell, imagine that tumor is going to secrete lots of estrogen. Sertoli cells, they produce lots of androgen. Most of them are benign. And most clinically malignant are granulosa cell tumor. What I said that granulosa cells secrete estrogen, Sertoli cells produce androgen. Most of them are benign. But clinically malignant out of these are granulosa cell tumor. Mix syndrome is seen with fibroma plus ascites plus right hydrothorax. Six cord tumor cells can have musculizing tumors as well as feminizing tumors. So if they secrete androgen, they will be having features and uh, the patient would have features of masculinization. So these are adenoblastoma and androblastoma. These tumors are seen commonly in 10 to 35 years of age group. Adrenal cortical tumor or lipoid cell tumor of the ovary, they are seen in postmenopausal group. Gynandroblastoma of ovary, it's a combination of granulosa and adenoblastoma. There would be signs of defeminization followed by masculinization. What are the signs? There would be change in the body contour, flattening of breast, uh, there would be increased hair growth, hoarseness of voice. As we treat the patient, whenever this tumor is either removed or uh, this source disappears, then there is these all changes are reversible. All these changes like the body contour will again become feminine. There would be growth of breast and these changes will again go back. But the non-reversible feature is hoarseness of voice. Even after treatment, hoarseness of voice cannot be changed or it doesn't change. The feminizing tumors are granulosa cell tumor, secret estrogen. Presentation of this tumor would be Precautious puberty, it is one of the most common cause of precautious puberty where pubertal changes are seen very early. Patient may present with amenorrhea because of unopposed action of estrogen. There can be menometroragia, that means menorrhagia plus intermenstrual bleeding. Postmenopausal bleeding can also be seen. These tumors are unilateral, they have low malignant potential. Coffee bean nuclei are seen and call Higgsner bodies. They may lead to endometrial hyperplasia again because of excessive and unopposed estrogen. And C endometrium is seen in 5% of these tumors. They also have inhibin as a marker. And treatment of choice is surgery and have good prognosis. Other tumors are from theca cell that is thicoma or fibroma. 
Once you say fibroma, you have to remember mix syndrome. Granulosa cell, always think of estrogen and precocious puberty, coffee bean nuclei and call Hexner bodies. So till now we have covered few types. We will stop here and the next session we will see what are the other types of ovarian tumors. Thank you.